Hello and welcome to another jungle tutorial and in this one I am going to be talking about the return of Kane and Rust in this ultimate carry guide. Apparently buffs and then some more buffs coupled with some extra buffs kind of makes you a strong champion. The thing that took them both over the edge though was the 10.9 buff making that W have a 90% slow and the full 1 second removed from the Q cooldown. This has naturally led to more experimentation with skill order especially from Rust players. To break down how you can best dominate with Kane in both forms, I will show you examples of dominating early games pre-form and then break down how both the Shadow Assassin and Rust can take over games. As always, if you enjoy these videos, please consider liking and maybe even subscribing if you love them. And now without hesitation, wait, Rust said he has something important to tell you. Do you hate revealing your location and broadcasting your every move? Do you have an annoying version of yourself from which you would like eternal peace and isolation? Then Rust recommends NordVPN, no data logging so you can practice without trace and also protect your data while traveling in the public domain. Super rapid server so you can queue faster than a high elo streamer tilts and add up to 6 simultaneous connections for maximum DPS. With your ability to unlock your favorite entertainment websites and watch global VODs, the double data encryption increases anonymity and this is how I forever destroyed Kane from disturbing my quest for domination of the multiverse. Click the link in the description below for 70% off NordVPN using nordvpn.com slash Okay then, I guess, uh, I guess now we can start. So before we get into anything else, there are some flotations with rune set crossovers and electrocute users, but for simplicity the core rune sets used by high elo players and cane mains for either blue form or red form would be harvest and then conqueror. You are seeing both of these choices on your screen now and secondary pages for rust are pretty standard in order to maximize those obscene heals. But for Shadow Assassin, there is some variance in that secondary rune page from the precision to sorcery for more up from burst. And obviously Nimbus is quite popular at the moment as well with many many champions. However the Dark Harvest coupled with a Relentless Hunter page, maybe Ravenous Hunter if you prefer to do that, is the absolute go to. If you do prefer the Relentless Hunter it gives you the movement speed for vicious ADC destruction and then of course the Harvest gives you the scaling stacks so that you can have put more damage than would actually seem natural. Rust might even be proud. In terms of how these runes play into your respective early clears, what form you should take, game plans and ganking, I have this Shadow Assassin 1v9 game and a Ross 1v9 game to show you the utmost strength of both forms and how you can translate your Harvest or Conqueror base form into a bunch of LP. And of course in terms of jungle roots at this point in the game's history we have many, all of which have been covered and done, so I will simply plug the route that I made a video about in March that shows you how to start raptors and then camp sequence with more efficiency than NA throws at groups to get level 6 first and then begin stomping the map. At the same time with Rice, you can obviously get a red leash, do the classical full clear roots, you can start raptors into red, into krugs, look for the early gank, crab or invade control. However, in Korea there's this new trend of super late Q mobility invades. The concept is you navigate around the lack of vision when the enemy team doesn't defend against your invade and this can lead to a very very sad start for the enemy jungle if they are on the red because you know you can just go and overuse WQ and a smite and they have no defense against this. So obviously looking at the enemy team comp for range champions this is definitely a blue cane game shadow assassin incoming let's look at how he navigates it with his dark harvest and to get his form as soon as possible. Now remember obviously you would usually take an e second for your clear so you can heal and navigate very quickly in this case you want to steal the red buff get those orbs from grave and then make a level 2 gank on the top side obviously if the lane is pushing in your favor if it's not you can simply look to go mid. Now you can help your Wukong shove because it's Korea they understand these things and in the early games we're going to talk about preform Kane. I want you guys to focus on the pathing, why they do what they do and the activity they use in order to get orbs that's still very natural in jungling flow. They're not forcing out to get orbs and fighting stupid things, they're just simply jungling. And in this case you know you shoved the graves off of his red, you stole it, I mean kind of lucky but you stole it nonetheless. He's going to be forced to go bottom side now either try and invade and steal your red in kind or do his blue side. Either way, Graves is on the bottom side. He gets revealed as you're rotating over, you start a 2v1 gank, Graves is right there to counter gank, unfortunately your mid laner dies, you get some juicy orbs nonetheless, back on out and now you have total control of your red side. You have stifled the Graves with a late cheesy invade, you've got a whole bunch of orbs already, very nice, and most importantly you've taken what people assume is an AFK farming camp sequencing jungler and basically done Rengar things by rotating and dominating the map and basically nullifying the enemy jungler's existence. With the Q buffs with a 90% slow W, you can actually do this now. You go back to base, your mid laner isn't there, they roam to the top side, you're grateful for this assistance and now you must help defend those minions for dying without a purpose. Take their experience, make their lives worthwhile and instead of going back to your blue and your gromp, head to the bottom side. 
You see your bottom lane is fighting? Okay, let's go ahead and, you know, clean up and get some more orbs plus another kill. Shove the wave. He's not focusing on FK farming, he's focusing on having good jungling practices, absorbing whatever experience is on the map, whether it's lanes, kills, or his own camps, and being mobile and aggressive at the same time. When you have harvest, this is very good because not only do you get orbs for your blue cane form, you also get more damage. After this, you need a bit of a relocation of the graves. You've lost track of him during the last few minutes. Let's see if he has any camps up on the bottom side. Go for a bit of counter jungling, nothing up, that's fine, we can wait around a little bit, and then Ezreal will of course show up because they saw you counter jungle, they want to know where you are and they don't want to get caught out in a trap, unfortunately, you know, he walks into the trap. Defeat him, get level 6, ult the karma, pick up another couple kills, and off you go about your business. Just be careful with Kane in the early game, don't AFK farm like a Giovanna, as you can see, you, that really doesn't help you whatsoever, and don't over greed for certain kills and situations. He dies on the top side, and when he respawns, he knows the Graves is on the red buff. This means you can reverse field. Don't go back to your blue, stick to the bottom side. However, you know, the counter jungling, the deep rotations, the flanks on the bottom side, in high elo games, this will eventually be detected. You will eventually be collapsed on, you might pick up an assist and get the orbs to give you your form. Just be understanding that when you are not close to that, dying in these situations gives up dragons, gives up objectives, can ultimately put you and your team behind against strong junglers. So just be a bit careful when you decide to Thanos for your form, you know, give up everything. Aggressive, fighty, counter jungling, probing, looking to be active, stack the harvest, stack the orbs. This can counter very differently to someone who went Conqueror because they know they want to go Ross. But it shouldn't necessarily be that way. There's just maybe less of an onus on getting those harvest stacks to make sure you're fed. As you're seeing from the highlights of this different early game, it was more focused on controlling your own red side clear, Looking for a gank and fight in mid lane, it's okay if you die, orbs are great. Then looking to control your bottom side, counter jungle, dive on the bottom lane tower. Remember you've got an Echo, a Pantheon, and an Orn. Three melees, an Ezreal, and he has an enhanced item on his back. The blue cane is really useful, especially if you have four squishies like in the previous example, because you need the mobility, you need the W interaction with Shadow Assassin, you need the enhanced ultimate range to stay on target to make sure you can dish out your damage. With Ryas, as you're seeing more highlights of tower dives and river skirmishes, you're looking to get in the midst of the fight, disrupt, survive, be annoying, and you can do those things with this rune set even in base form. As you can see, 7 minute Ryas is achieved through those few simple highlights. There's nothing else really going on other than farming, looking to count on jungle, and look for those fights. But in a day and age with a Graves and a Kindred, you've got ranged mid laners, ranged bottom laners, Blue Kane can really be very successful. Please note though that Kindred and Graves historically do counter Kane in the early game. You have to play smart, you have to play like we did in the first gameplay example. Surprise them, remove them from the game, don't let them get a leg up on you such that they can actually destroy you. And on that note, let's segue back to the first gameplay example and look how Shadow Assassin can completely dominate a game what you should do and what you shouldn't do in order to finish out and get the win. Now obviously we had a slightly delayed form in this game just because of the set interactions, the early gangs, the death of the tribush. But with the Shadow Assassin finally being realized, I need to give you the reminder that you are squishy. You are an assassin, you do not have Edge of Night yet, you can be CC'd, you can be miasmed, you can be killed just as easily as you can kill. Thus, you really must not go forcing those assassinations. Let it come naturally to you, the enemy squishies will die, Patience Viceroy, don't go in and die too many times. Now the player we're choosing to follow does like to put 4 points into Q and then Max W, get the benefits without going overboard and then stashing in the W burst damage that you need for the Shadow Assassin. However, seeing 3 points into Q and into W Max is also still coming just because of the Q CDR buffs. You get what was previously rank 5 CDR at rank 3 and so the benefit there is that you have it up as often as you did in the previous patch except at rank 3 instead of rank 5. Nonetheless, with the int over, with the stress testing finished, he says, you know what, that's enough, it's time to take over the game. Out of the base, E through the wall to get up to the top lane with your Moby Boots, straight to the counter gang on the Graves and Nimbus Cloak Smite coming in, the auto attack for the Shadow Assassin passive, the ultimate smooth exit into a Q on the set, and now you've got 8 kills. All of a sudden things will begin to come together, and when they do, you must not forget these objectives. Down to the Herald, please secure these things, I know Shadow Assassin players, you like to run around killing all the squishies, but don't forget the objectives, they are the things that win you games. Once you've done that, do what the Shadow Assassin does best, I guess we can call it the 3 F's, float, flank and flow throughout the map, activate your Herald once you have of course dispatched the enemy mid laner with obscene damage. If they start the dragon, make sure you push them off. If you see targets split off from the rest of the team, roaming mid lanes, there's no towers, ensure you as the Shadow Assassin take care of business. That means use your E, get in range, ult, take them out with the burst. Too often in this situation, I would see Shadow Assassin players, you know, after the mid lane herald play, go into their jungle, shove them off dragon, go back to their Krugs, 
look for the picks, and then look for the subsequent objectives. But again, please don't greed and go on down and die. You have at this point so much gold, since the first time you left base with these items, you had 6 kills, now you have 11. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit because things will stagnate. The enemy team will group, they will try and use their numbers advantages and vision control to ensure you cannot flank and annihilate them. And that's where itemization kinda comes in. As you watch this cane flank and go in and out using his E and his Moby boots, Yes, the use of Ghostblade with Duskblade is a core itemization choice, and I know you 1v9 addicts don't want to hear this, but please keep Edge of Night in mind as a secondary item if they have insane amounts of CC. Obviously in these team fights, it's not as important for this particular game. If they group up like this, that's exactly what you want for Shadow Assassin. A grouped up team into a WQ combo with an ultimate is absolutely disgusting, especially seeing as your Q will be up once you come out of the ultimate anyway, and with the cooldown buffs, you will actually have it up in more rotations overall. Nonetheless, they are actually able to get the Baron off of this play, and now they're contesting over a Dragon. And this is a great example of how to use this Shadow Assassin if flanking is not available to you. Obviously, you want to use your E to position to dive back lines to get the WQ ultimate auto off. However, if the enemy team, any enemy squishy steps too far forward and gets hit with that W, use that enhanced ultimate range. Make sure you get deep, deep inside their souls. And as you exit, maneuver around, flash, do whatever you need to do to look amazing, miss your spells, but kill them anyway. Now, he doesn't exactly have too many more kills able to get in the rest of this game, but you will see highlights of how he navigates those fights with the ease and situates himself to flank. Just as a final note about itemization, it is common to see a lot of lethality into a Last Whisper item as the final one. In this case, he's just going absolute straight full lethality. It is normal to see three lethality items in the Dusk Blade, Ghost Blade, and Edge of Night. As such, the last item being a Last Whisper, I think is very useful. It will basically give you true damage onto the enemies. If there is a target with lots of healing, you can of course go Mortal Reminder. And then the straight penetration from Lord Dominic's basically means if there's any other tanky or fightery type of person, like I said, that might be stacking that MR. Hell, even the Graves with his Death's Dance, I do advise that over a final Thality item. And as long as you play those fights while you have good itemization, that game should be yours to close in the bag. And if we shift back to our Ross game, nothing changes in terms of your decision making. You're still looking to go and use your form as soon as you get it, in this case, a nice double kill on the top lane. But look at how different this is even watching the video. You are slower, you are more clunky, you have less flank ability. However, your healing, your CC, your disruption is absolutely disgusting. And this is where Rask really differs to Shadow Assassin. Yes, you can still make the same plays. After you get the double kill on the top lane, you flow on down to the Herald. Where Rast actually dominates, as you can watch in the sequence as he sticks around the map for ages, is his staying power. You can stay on the map longer because of your healing. You can turn bad situations into great situations. You can be very low and E out, go back in, heal, use your ultimate and come out even more healthy than the enemy was at the beginning of the fight. Except, you know, they're dead. While you might like those extended sequences from the Shadow Assassin, once you get squished out, once you get bursted out, you most likely die. In Rust's case, you actually want to use these extended sequences to stay on the map for as long as possible, bait enemies into these fights and these counter jungling situations that might seem bad for you, but actually, you know, they're bad for the enemy because you understand how much healing you're getting from your rune set and your champion choice. Hopefully you can see through this sped up sequence how this particular Kane player, this Ross player, challenger in Korea, uses the map rotations and the longevity of his particular sustain to take his camps to counter jungle, to gank lanes, to get objectives, all within a single rotation of being out. Now while he does that, it's important to talk about itemization like it was with the Shadow Assassin. In this case, yes, you can take the blue smite because obviously it's nice to have the stickiness. It's nice to actually be able to get close to your target because you don't have the mobility of blue cane. However, in this case, because of the W slow being 90%, because rushing black cleaver and maxing Q basically gives you a just over two second Q spam, you don't really need to do that. Red Smite is absolutely fine against most melees, you're going to be dueling it out anyway. But yes, Black Cleaver is still cool. The Phage Passive, the CDR, the armor stacking if you have a good ADC on your team, not to mention your own stacking because of your Conqueror and auto attacks. But as you watch this kind of messy fight, what's the item giving him this disgusting healing that goes with his runes? His passive as well as the Conqueror, Death Stunts. Yes, the added resistances coupled with the healing really makes this a good secondary item after Black Cleaver. A lot of people are building it before Sterex and GA, however basically that's your core itemization. Warrior, Cleaver, Deadman, Sterex and GA. However, if you need to be more of an off tank, if you need the Spirit Visage and a Deadman's, 
you can do that after Black Cleaver as well. However, in most cases, this is the build I'm seeing. This is the build that lets you have these ridiculous fights that you've been watching, where you can miss all the Ws in the world because of the enemy team's mobility, but the Q spam plus the heal lets you consistently disrupt and annoy and frustrate and basically outsustain anything in the game. However, the power of Rust is using your build and using your team fight to actually win games. Your scaling and your CC makes this more inevitable than Thanos. And yes, that's two references in one video. What are you going to do? Watch this team fight. As the enemy team says, hey, you know what? We have the better scaling. We can actually win this game. They group up and try and fight. Rust says, that's great. Firstly, use your W to peel. It is an amazing peel tool. Don't forget this. You're not like the Shadow Assassin who would be looking to flank in this situation. Use your W to keep the Pantheon off of your team. Once that's done, once the Diver is dealt with, now you can turn and look to their backline and disrupt their tank. This is where the importance of your W comes in. You can afford to miss it and chase people down in messy mid-game skirmishes, but in organized 5v5 teamfights to win the game, you must hit this knockup. You must keep chaining together Qs. You must chase down, sustain, and auto-attack. It's great enough to use extended sequences as Ross to get objectives, dive towers, and make sure your team is in the game. Or if you're blue cane, simply enough to assassinate and take care of the squishy targets. However, these mid to late game phases when Kane scales with disgusting damage, healing and mobility, depending on which form you choose, is exactly how you 1v9 with this champion in Season 10. I know this was a different style of video, but I really wanted to highlight the strength of both forms, show you examples and the similarities between the base Kane early games, no matter what rune set you choose, and then also show you the atomization and choices you must make in order to carry with either the blue or the red. Welcome back Kane, it's been way too long since you've been strong. Let's hope the Rust and Red form nerfs are not over the top and we can continue to dominate with this champion because honestly, the jungle meta needs a bit of a refresh. Having Rust come in, having Volley come soon is going to be a sustaining nightmare for enemy junglers and team compositions. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you're able to enjoy and learn something. Please do like, share and comment if you did. I always like to reach around 1500 likes and I was going to give you a reason why, but you know what, I just like the dopamine hit. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel as well as the Vakayu Gameplay Coaching channel, and as always, I will see you all in the next tutorial.